Welcome. I would uh, urge all of you to put your phones away. You know, we are so locked into our phones. Believe me, trust me, in the next hour, if you don't talk to your girlfriend, boyfriend, anybody else, or Twitter, your life will still be okay. So enjoy this conversation today, uh, rather than. So in a minute or so, we are going to go live uh, on Facebook. But I wanted to uh, make sure that everybody uh, has their phones on silent. Uh, and uh, I'll just wait for a minute before I introduce you, because we are going to start uh, at 11. But uh, uh, good to see a lot of faces. Let me, let me first uh, see a, sh a show of hands here. How many of you are here who are not from ISB? Let me see a show of hands. OK, awesome. That's uh, welcome. Welcome to ISB. And uh, uh, the, let me just see the people who are from ISB here. OK. So uh, go, good number of people from ISB as well. Uh, excellent. And for uh, some people who are, couldn't be here, they're watching us uh, on Facebook Live. So, uh, and we also have another room here, is that right, Swati? And there are some people uh, in another room here as well. OK. So 11 o'clock. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, for our next edition of the Global ISB Forum. It gives me, uh, it's a moment of great pride for me. And pride has two meanings for me today here. Uh, to invite uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Viral Acharya. Dr. Acharya has been a, uh, a, not a newcomer to ISB. In fact, many years ago, uh, Dr. Acharya and I taught in this very classroom, uh, corporate finance. Um, and uh, in, fact, in fact, I remember uh, um, visiting some microfinance organizations which were two hours away. And while we were sitting in the car, we were actually making the problems for our exams uh, together. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So welcome, welcome. Um, and um, this is probably not the last time he's going to be here as well. And uh, I welcome you to come back to ISB anytime, either to teach or to talk to us or just to hang out with us. OK. So today, uh, I've invited uh, Dr. Acharya to come and tell us about um, um, how to create markets that are functioning and viable, which can support robust growth in the country for many decades to come. Um, Dr. Acharya has done a number of work, a number of papers written in this field, but uh, his experience in the last three years in trying to implement some of these uh, uh, ideas, uh, today he's going to talk about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the floor to, to Viral, and we will have a chance to ask questions after he has uh, finished uh, telling us about what some of those ideas are. So Viral, it's yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bhagwan, uh, for inviting me here. Uh, and thank you so much, all of you, for taking our time on your Saturday mornings. Uh, to be here, it's a little hard to come during the weekdays. So I thought it's better that I commit and then show up rather than default. And I'll have something to say on default. So that I can talk. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, it's. Um, um, I, I, this is a topic very close to my heart. Uh, what I've done is I've actually written up my remarks, and they should already be on the RBI website already, or maybe in a couple of minutes. So uh, when you go back, uh, unless I have convinced you to stay away from finance as much as possible, 
uh, you can go back and have a look at uh, the remarks. So, um, uh, development of viable capital markets uh, is an important uh, issue at the current juncture in India, in my opinion, uh, because capital markets play a crucial role in the economic development of a country. They provide financial resources, as Bhagwan mentioned, uh, that are required for the long-term sustainable development of the economy. Uh, and therefore, development of viable capital markets is considered uh, an important element, one of the many important elements in the macro-financial policy toolkit, including for objectives such as financial stability and the transmission of monetary policy. Now, for most of what I'm going to do, for uh, the next three hours, I'm sorry, this is going to be 45 minutes, uh, uh, is to take this as given and focus more on uh, directly what leads to the development of capital markets. Now, uh, one reason why I chose this topic is because I was involved uh, in an effort on this theme uh, in one international forum. Uh, there's something called the Committee on Global Financial System. Uh, it's a committee of central bank governors and deputy governors, uh, which meets at the Bank uh, for International Settlements called the BIS uh, in Basel. Uh, this committee, the CGFS as it's called, the Committee on Global Financial System, it constituted a working group last year to examine global trends in capital market development identify various factors such as legal, institutional, structural, and conjunctural that foster the development of robust capital markets, uh, and consider the role of policy measures, uh, including what can be considered as macroprudential measures, which are not just aimed at development of markets, but ensuring that they remain safe, robust, uh, and survive periods of time. Uh, the working group was co-chaired by the People's Bank of China uh, and the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, I was representing the Reserve Bank of India and my counterpart at People's Bank of China, Dr. Li Bo, uh, he was the other co-chair of this report. Uh, the working group focused on issues primarily related to the development of markets in bond and equity securities. Uh, the CGFS report is available on the uh, website uh, of the BIS, uh, and uh, that's the link over there. Uh, I, it's, it's, a, it's, it's really an excellent report. It has a lot of cross-country survey that we did as part of the working group to understand what is holding back the development of markets in different countries, including in many cases advanced economies. And I want to stress this that while development of cash markets, the primary debt and equity markets, is arguably of greater relevance to emerging market economies, uh, we found that the issues we were examining, which I'm going to summarize shortly, they were of significant interest even in advanced economies because everything is on a spectrum. Uh, it's not that there are advanced economies and emerging market economies and it's black and white. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of gray shades and different countries are sitting at different parts of this spectrum in terms of development of specific markets. Uh, so the CGFS report uh, identified the drivers of capital market development. This was one of our main uh, mandates or charge, so to speak. Uh, we categorized them into two types, uh, drivers which create an enabling environment for financial development and drivers which are more capital market specific. Okay, and uh, the distinction is quite important uh, in the sense that uh, the conclusion we reached after almost three or four days of deliberation spread over six months was that the reason why we were struggling to reach consensus was because we hadn't agreed that you just can't develop capital markets out of, uh, out of the blue you actually need to create some preconditions in the macro economy that are conducive to development of capital markets. And once we uh, sort of had that Eureka moment, uh, then we were able to organize the drivers into these two uh, categories. So drivers which create an enabling environment as identified in the CGFS report, they include macroeconomic stability, 
a broad respect for market autonomy, which is to let the markets function rather than the regulators or the government uh, intervening in markets on a, what I would say a frequent or an unnecessary basis. Uh, third, fair and efficient legal and judicial systems and an efficient regulatory regime that creates conditions favorable for design and enforcement of financial contracts. Uh, and one way of thinking about this enabling environment drivers is that this is really about one, on the one hand, macroeconomic stability, uh, sort of setting the rules for how the markets are supposed to function and allowing them to function in that way. And a little bit of what you might have studied in your uh, degree programs, uh, that there's a linkage between the rule of law and finance. Uh, that rule of law, uh, not sort of just de jure, but de facto, which is do you actually have laws functioning in practice? That's a very important uh, determinant of whether capital markets can succeed. Drivers which we identified as being more specific to the capital markets were the following, easy access to high quality material information, so good, good disclosure standards, uh, diversity in the investor base, uh, efficient market ecosystem for trading and robust market infrastructure, so that's more about the plumbing of the capital markets, um, openness towards international investors while maintaining macroeconomic stability, and markets for hedging and funding security. So not just the cash markets, but the cash markets develop better when complementary markets where you can raise financing against your equity position or against your bond positions, or you can manage the interest rate risk of a bond position using derivatives markets. These markets in themselves uh, help the cash markets grow to be larger. The CGFS report uh, also made six broad policy recommendations, which are the following. And of course, they flow from what we identified as the drivers of capital markets. Uh, promoting greater market autonomy. Uh, second, strengthening legal and judicial systems for investor protection. Third, enhancing regulatory independence and effectiveness. Fourth, increasing the depth and diversity of the domestic institutional investor base. Fifth, opening up capital markets internationally and in a bi-directional manner. So allow foreign participants to come into your domestic economy and allow domestic participants to tap into markets abroad, all while uh, taking account of whatever are the country-specific macroprudential considerations. Uh, and sixth, developing complementary markets for derivatives, repo transactions, and securities lending. So essentially, risk transfer markets, which are the derivatives markets, and funding markets against your positions, which are the repo and the securities lending markets. Uh, I find the report quite good, uh, partly because I was a co-chair, uh, but I also find the report quite useful because sometimes big topics uh, you know, it, it sort of you can just shoot from anywhere and come up with every single idea under the sun. And it helps to have an organizing framework so that you can sky through it. And when you are a policymaker and trying to identify gaps that you need to fill, you have a framework through which you are observing, say, the capital market of India from a 35,000 feet uh, sort of view. Uh, it's, it's our assessment that policy initiatives in India have largely been in sync with the findings and recommendations of this uh, CGFS report. Uh, I shall discuss these as well as future policy directions after I provide you a brief overview of the Indian capital markets. While the scope of the CGFS report is the entire uh, capital market, I will largely confine these remarks to the markets that are regulated by the Reserve Bank, uh, uh, namely the interest rate markets. So the fixed income markets is the primary space I'm going to talk about. However, to a lesser extent, I'll also touch here and there about the foreign exchange markets, which are also regulated by the Reserve Bank. Okay. So uh, in terms of the overview, I'll first start with uh, what are generally considered as the metrics. Uh, for assessing the stage of development of capital markets. Now, most of you know this, but I'll just repeat. 
uh, that Indian capital markets actually have a history of more than a century. In fact, the Indian stock exchanges, the Bombay Stock Exchange, is one of the few exchanges in the world that has actually never shut down, even during wars and other crisis periods. Uh, however, the Indian capital markets remained largely inactive till the 1970s. Partial liberalization of the economy and pro-capital market policies during the 1980s infused some life into these markets, but it was only the economic liberalization of the 1990s that provided a lasting impetus to their growth. Today, and this, is, this was one of the surprises uh, to many of us in the CGFS report, that today segments of India's capital markets are comparable with counterparts in many of the advanced economies, not just other emerging market economies, but <coughs> counterparts in many of the advanced economies in terms of efficiency, so the quality of price discovery that's happening in the markets, tradability, so low impact costs of doing your transactions, resilience, which is that our markets behaving in fairly segmented manner so that uh, they are prone to failures very quickly, or are there equilibrating forces across markets so that they are co-moving in response to macroeconomic information? Uh, and stability, can they withstand uh, large shocks, crises, episodes? In particular, the ability of the Indian capital markets to withstand several periods of stress, uh, notably the Asian financial crisis in 97-98, the global financial crisis in 2007-09, and the taper tantrum episode in 2013, uh, the fact that the markets were able to withstand these stress periods is a sign of their increasing maturity in my view. Okay, now let's turn to size. Uh, all the ma major segments of the capital market, so there are four over here, uh, which I'll primarily focus on. The GSEC, that's the Central Government of India Securities, SDL, these are the state development loans. These are essentially the bonds that are issued by individual states. Uh, the corporate bonds, which are issued by private enterprises, but also by state-owned enterprises, they also fall into the corporate bonds category. And then, of course, the equity markets uh, that companies tap into for raising uh, equity financing. Collectively, these markets are generally called as the cash markets. Of course, foreign exchange can also be considered as a cash market, but as I said, I'm going to not focus on that much. I'm also not going to focus too much on the equity markets eventually. But what you can see here is that over this period of last 10 years, as the Indian economy has been growing, so have these cash markets. They have experienced consistent growth uh, in fact, not just over the last decade, but during the past two decades, in terms of primary issuance, uh, levels of market capitalization, uh, in case of equity markets, and also trading volumes in the secondary market. What you can see here is that in uh, equity market, which is on the right-hand scale, is of course the largest market in India at present. Uh, it's you know in the range of 80 to 90 percent of the GDP of the economy. The other markets, however, are gradually getting uh, to be quite large uh, as well. The other markets are on the uh, left axis over here. Uh, so let's, let's understand the government securities markets a little bit more. That would be the GSEC market and the SDL market. Uh, what has uh, enabled the growth of uh, the government securities market? Uh, and uh, it might seem a bit simplistic, but a streamlined, transparent, and market-based primary issuance process has been the key uh, ingredient that has underpinned the development of the government securities markets, both in case of GSECs as well as the SDLs. So let me elaborate as to what I mean by this. In the primary GSEC market, so when the GSECs or the new government securities are being issued, uh, the issuances are made per a half-yearly pre-announced calendar. So investors know what the government of India is going to issue at what point of time over the next six months. The calendar specifies the amount, uh, the tenor of securities, so the maturity of the bonds, and the issuance dates. 
the tenor of the G sex presently goes up to 40 years. Uh, that's quite long, actually. It's quite that's uh, quite uh, that sign of a fairly mature market. The G sex tend typically to be fixed coupon bonds, although instruments such as inflation linked bonds, capital index bonds, floating rate bonds, and bonds that have some embedded optionality have also been issued at different points of time. Currently, all issuances of GSEX are done through weekly auctions. So every week uh, there, is, uh, there is an auction. Issuances are, uh, that's the idli coming back. Uh, so the issuances are supported by primary dealers or PDs uh, who fully underwrite the issues. So even if there isn't adequate investor interest, the issuance will ultimately be taken on by the primary dealers as the underwriters. So by and large, the auctions of GSEX or government securities, quote unquote, they do not fail. Someone who is an underwriter is committed to actually taking on the auction uh, uh, the securities that are being auctioned. How do the auctions work? Uh, auctions are conducted through both competitive bidding uh, com in the, those who bid competitively in the auction, they bid an amount as well as a price at which they will buy the security. So you give your schedule that at this price I'm willing to buy so much. Uh, these, who are these entities? They are all the resident institutions, uh, foreign portfolio investors or FPIs, and non-resident Indians or NRIs. Uh, they can do this competitive bidding and based on the supply in the auction, which is how much the government of India or the Reserve Bank as the debt manager for the government of India is selling in the auction, you basically clear that against the demand and that determines the market clearing price at which the bonds are going to be issued in the primary market. There's also non-competitive bidding that's primarily for retail investors. What does non-competitive bidding mean? They don't indicate a price, they just say that at whatever is the market clearing price, I'm interested in buying such an amount. So they will receive a certain allotment of securities from the total supply that is being provided at the market clearing price. More than 90% of the issuances are done through reopening of existing securities. So if a bond with say 8% coupon and 10 years maturity was issued three weeks back, you will reopen that issue and add to the total outstanding amount of that issue. This is extremely important because this is what has contributed to significant market liquidity by spreading out the ownership of a given security or a bond issue across a large number of investors. And there's another sophisticated market uh, which hasn't taken off fully, but it's there in India. Uh, it's called as a well-issued segment of the GSEC market, which is that you know the auction is happening every week, you can actually start taking a bet on acquiring the security at a given price in the when issued market even before the auction has actually taken place. And there's a footnote in the remarks that explains in a little bit more detail the when issued market and how it works and why it is good. What it does is that it actually starts generating price discovery about the market clearing price in the auction even before the auction has actually taken place. And in turn, that will improve the demand schedules that are actually being submitted uh, to the auction. Now, uh, that was on the primary issuance. And this is actually, you can see this is a bit sort of uh, nuts and bolts. But this is extremely important because those who are investing their money need a little bit of predictability about the supply function that the government of India has in mind for these securities. Now the profile of both GSEX and SDLs in terms of stock and flow characteristics, I'm going to show you two tables. I want to highlight two points. Uh, the first thing, this is primarily for the GSEX, so the central government securities. What you see here is that the yield on this security over the last five, six years has been steadily coming down. It has come down from 8.5. 4% uh, in fact to a low of around 7% last year. This is the flow statistic, so that's what is being issued during the year. Of course, each year's flow contributes only a small amount to the outstanding stock of the GSEX that is out there. Recall that the stock has maturities as long as 40 years. And in fact, the average maturity of the outstanding stock 
was around 10 years, it's gradually inching up towards 10.5. It takes a while because the stock is quite large, but you can see that the weighted average maturity on, in a flow sense each year is substantially larger than the outstanding stock. Okay, and this is again one sign of the maturity of the bond market, which is that you are able to supply longer dated paper. Why is it a sign of maturity? Because the longer a bond is held by an investor, the larger is the set of macroeconomic inflation and other shocks that they are exposed to. So it shows some amount of risk-taking capacity by the investors and the willingness of the government to accept a slightly higher issuance cost while they are actually managing the government finances. Uh, second, if you go now both to the profile of GSEX and SDLs, these are the quantities. Let's look at the issuance over here. Uh, in the, so that's again a flow characteristic. This is the central government bonds and these are the SDLs. What you see here is that in the early uh, part of this table, which is 2013-14, the share of the issuance of SDLs relative to the central government bonds was about 25%. Okay, so $30 billion out of 120 total. However, by the time you get to 2018-19, it's now getting close to 50%. It's around 45%, okay? which shows that actually the state development loans share in the Indian fixed income markets is actually growing steadily uh, with time. That has something to do with the glide path for their debt composition as a whole as per the FRBM or the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management uh, Act. Okay, so those are some of the size metrics. What about liquidity of this government securities market? Now, liquidity in the secondary market for government securities has notably improved for India over the past decade, as you can see uh, in this chart. Uh, these are the average uh, daily volumes of trading. The blue line is the GSEC. For simplicity, I have included here both the S and the treasury bills, which are the very short-term GSEX. Uh, the yellow line is the equity uh, daily trading volume, and then the red line is the corporate bonds. So you can see here that actually the fixed income market, especially the government security segment, is actually now trading on a daily basis far more than the equity trading volume in the country. And you can see that this wasn't the case at the beginning of the decade that I have shown over here. They were roughly on the same quantum, but now the government bond market has actually taken over. Uh, of course, corporate bonds are not as liquid, and uh, I'll have something to say about that later on. Uh, importantly, though, uh, even though the daily volume is high, the liquidity in the GSEX is mainly concentrated in what are called as benchmark securities. What are benchmark securities? Uh, so there's a 10-year benchmark that gets issued in a large quantity through a reopening on a regular basis. Then as six months say go by, that 10-year benchmark will be nine and a half years maturity left. Then it becomes what is called as off the run. And a new 10-year benchmark security will get created, which is called as on the run. The liquidity is highest in the on-the-run security, which is the most recently issued 10-year benchmark. And then when it becomes off-the-run, the liquidity dips, but typically it is still higher than other securities uh, in the Indian yield curve. The SDLs, in contrast, tend to be relatively less <coughs> liquid than the GSEX because each state is actually issuing its own SDLs. So that fragments the standardization of the security as a result. So if this is, if, if there's a whole pool of SDL issuance, it is actually fragmented into different securities based on maturity and yields issued by each specific state. And therefore, the yield on the SDLs in the Indian markets is typically 50 to 75 basis points greater than the central government securities even though their credit risks are perceived to be at roughly the same level. Okay, so it's an illiquidity premium that an investor earns when they buy the SDLs relative to the GSEX. Of course, it's not for free. You are buying an illiquid bond, and therefore you are earning a higher yield uh, in return. Now, the average bid-ask spread, which is one way of measuring 
the liquidity of a security in the GSEC market has interestingly remained less than a basis point during the last few years. And, and this is actually quite, rem a quite remarkable uh, a sign of success uh, for the Indian GSEC market. And what is even more interesting, and so even though there is some movement, I think the primary point of this chart is not that the bid ask spread is moving around, but that for most part it has actually remained below one basis point. That's actually quite tiny, and that's consistent with the fact that the volumes of trading in the GSEC market are now actually quite large, even relative to the equity markets. Now, what is, what is even more striking is the fact that if you compare the bid-ask spread, uh, so, so the uh, crosses here are the, let me just check that. So uh, the, uh, the crosses here, which are on the, the BIDAS spread are in basis points on the left. Uh, and uh, the, the cross is actually the BIDAS spread and the vertical bars are the price impact, which is that if you had to do a $10 million transaction, how much would you move the price of the security simply because of the fact that you entered the market and tried to buy it. Okay, the BIDAS spread simply means that if you're trying to buy the bond versus selling the bond, you have to pay a slightly higher price when you buy compared to the price that you will get when you sell the bond. So whoever is making the markets for you is charging that fee as a spread. And you can imagine that if that spread is, is very large, you will not want to trade in and out of a security position too much because whatever investment return you are trying to generate will simply get eroded in the commission or the fees that you are trying to pay the market maker. Uh, now, what you observe, so India IN is rightmost over there. These are sorted by these crosses, which are the bidas spread. And these were, uh, in the CGFS report, these were gathered for the countries that we surveyed uh, in our report to understand the drivers of capital markets. And what we found was that for the 10-year benchmark, which is usually the most liquid benchmark in all countries, uh, actually, the bidas spread on the Indian 10-year benchmark is, in fact, the lowest in all these countries. So we are not just comparable to other emerging markets. In fact, the bidas spread in Indian g is lower even than advanced economies. Uh, and, uh, and while there is, that's not true necessarily of the price impact, you can see that the red bar stands out for India a bit in case of US, France, Great Britain, you can see that the bar is not even visible. So the price impact for trading there is actually uh, almost negligible, the same way for Japan uh, as well, and uh, I think also the German goods. Um, nevertheless, I thought this was actually a very interesting uh, fact that I was not aware of until I did the CGFS report. So sometimes to understand your own market is better to look outside. <laughs> so you have a sense of where you stand in a relative uh, sense. Okay. So uh, there are several proximate drivers of this secondary market liquidity in the Indian GSEC market. Uh, I will only list a few of these, but uh, there are many, many uh, that the Reserve Bank uh, has been working on over a period of time. And I think it's great credit, uh, frankly, to the governors and the deputy governors and the teams over the past uh, two decades who have really helped develop this market uh, to such a healthy state. First, regular issuance of the 10-year benchmark, as I mentioned, has concentrated trading interest in that segment of the yield curve. So even though there are a lot of securities along the yield curve, you can take an interest rate view on the Indian uh, yield curve basically by trading in the most liquid security, which is the 10-year, because everyone is primarily trading that. Uh, efforts are presently underway to regularize issuance of benchmark securities even at shorter maturities like two years, five years. In fact, what would be great is if that you have liquid treasury bills, then you have a one year, two year, five year, seven year, also trading actually quite liquidly. Uh, now, we will need uh, a few more years before that happens, but efforts are already underway. So benchmarking is one of the important contributors to this uh, liquidity in the secondary market. Second, and I think this is pretty important and not as appreciated uh, uh, 
both within India and outside, is that secondary market transactions in the Indian government securities market are predominantly around 80% conducted in an anonymous electronic order matching system, which is called as NDSO, uh, Negotiated Dealing System Order Matching. Uh, this is actually quite unique for fixed income market trading in the world. In most fixed income markets in the world, trading is done through what are called as dealer networks. One bank will call another bank and the dealers will actually negotiate a price at which they want to trade. Now you can see that that is not always conducive to having a low bid ask spread because if I call someone and ask him at what price will I trade, if they know I'm a large mutual fund or a large insurance company, they will know that, oh, this is a big order coming in and I could actually move the price by revealing my identity. So very often what's important in trading is that you remain anonymous when you are trading. So what NDS Ohm does is that it allows each participant to submit an order all the way from a retail investor to, say, the Life Insurance Corporation of India. They can both submit an anonymous order on this matching platform saying I'm willing to trade so much at such and such price. There are some buy orders, there are some sell orders. The system just crosses the orders and matches them. So you don't know who has actually, who you have hit on the other side of the market. It's entirely anonymous. Now why does this lead to liquidity? It leads to liquidity because you find that in dealer networks, retail investors are usually creamed off by the dealers. So a small guy like me goes and says, I want to do a GSEC transaction. If I'm going through a dealer, they will say, you know, he clearly can't have too much capacity to search for the right price. He doesn't have access to all the players in the market. I can really charge him a very nice bid ask spread. Okay, but in NDS home, you don't know that it's a retail investor. And why is that important? Because a retail investor's trade may be of the same size as LIC is trade. Why? Because if LIC is doing a large trade, it's not going to send a large order. They are going to stealthily break it up into lots of small, small orders because no one can actually put together that the string of different orders which are there all belong to LIC. It just looks like anyone's anonymous, small, broken up order. So there's a lot of pooling of identity that's happening on the NDS home market, which means that everyone basically trades at a good price rather than based on whether you have strong or weak bargaining power which gets exploited in the dealer network. Now that's not to say that you can't trade over the counter if a participant thinks that they can get a better price by going into an over the counter trade. They can do that outside of the NDS home but they are nevertheless required to report the transactions on the NDS home platform. So the platform on the one hand provides anonymous trading avenue but at the same time, it provides full transparency about all the trades that are taking place because even over-the-counter trades have to be reported on the platform. Okay, so that was the second reason, uh, anonymous trading. Third, uh, which I've already mentioned, there is near real-time dissemination of trade information which is publicly available to any market participant on the website of the Clearing Corporation of India, the CCIL, and that uh, creates a lot of price transparency. So you have price and volume transparency. Fourth, uh, settlement in the government securities market is guaranteed by the Clearing Corporation of India, the CCIL. Uh, and the CCIL, when it was set up by the Reserve Bank, it was uh, Reserve Bank's initiative to set it up. It's owned by market participants. Um, it was way ahead of even such arrangements uh, in the United States. In fact, Timothy Geithner, who was the U.S. Uh, the New York Fed uh, president uh, during 2004-05, he had come to the Reserve Bank of India to see how the Clearing Corporation of India functions because they wanted to design a similar arrangement uh, for the U.S. treasuries. Uh, now, what is the role of CCIL? CCIL essentially guarantees the, uh, settlement. Okay? It says that if you have done a transaction between two parties, even if one party fails to deliver the bonds, so let's say I go and do a trade, but actually with my account, which is in a custodian bank, at the end of the day, there were no securities to be found. That would lead to a delivery failure, which is that even though I agreed to sell you the bonds, the bonds are actually not there in my account with the custodian. 
CCIL guarantees the delivery. Of course, it has to manage the risk of these kinds of outcomes. But the guaranteed settlement, which is on a T plus one basis, so if you do the trade today, the settlement is next day. This means there is a lot of predictability in the market, and you don't have to worry about charging a high bid ask spread because you are not sure whether you'll get securities in the first place. And fifth, uh, there's a short selling market which is also now active in India. In a short selling market, what do you do? Uh, let's say I have a bearish view on the bonds. I don't own the bonds, so I can't go and sell my own bonds. So what you do in a short selling transaction is that first you borrow bonds from someone who has the bonds, say for a week. Then you, once you have borrowed the bonds, you sell them in the market because you want to express a bearish view. So you want to sell them today in anticipation that the prices are actually going to come down. That time you will buy the bonds and repay the bonds to the party that you have borrowed from. So this short selling market is also active and it facilitates a two-way interest adding both to activity or liquidity and as well as price discovery uh, in the market. Uh, I see that Prachi Deuskar is here. She's an expert in the NDS home market. So if whatever I said uh, was not 100% clear, I strongly encourage you to bugger in her office. So, uh, okay. So uh, next, uh, let's look at growth and liquidity of the corporate bond market. So, so far I was talking about the government securities markets. Uh, is it a good time to take a respiratory pause and see if there are any questions? Sure. Okay. Uh, just clarifying questions. Okay. If there are more general questions, I'll answer them. I'm uh, the sure you understood everything so far. So, uh, uh, please make sure the questions are clarifying. Like, you know, what does GSEC really mean? Or, but not like, you know, like, why are you leaving RBI? No, none of that. <laughs> Yeah, so there is this thing called the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act, which has given a light path for where they want the overall borrowings of the country government <coughs> to come down to. So there's a light path and then the budgets at the beginning of each year determine the fiscal deficits and how much borrowing has to take place. And then end of March, usually a calendar is then produced of how the borrowings will be undertaken. As you can imagine, it's a complex exercise because some bonds have to be repaid, which are maturing from past issuances. So your gross issuances, which is how much new bond you are going to issue, is not just to meet your new spending needs, it's also to meet your repayment needs from the past issuances that have taken place. But as I showed you, over time what is happening is the share of central government bonds in the total stock is coming down and the share of SDLs is going up. Uh, and I think you can see the FRBM Act uh, to see what the life path is and where the government right now is related to that life path. Okay. Okay. Budget and uh, no, those are at the level of the uh, finance ministry and the Department of Economic Affairs. They are the ones determining the uh, spending needs and the budgetary needs and how they want to raise the financing. And the Reserve Bank of India is at present a debt manager for the government, so the, uh, the RBI runs the primary auction. Uh, and you know, the, as I said, it goes through this process where the primary dealers, both bank. Bank PDs, they they underwrite the auction. So for some reason, the demand in an auction is not very high. Then the auction is supposed to devolve onto the underwriters. That is usually when, for some reason, the volatility is very high or supply is very large relative to the demand in a given month. Uh, but you know, typically, of course, there are consultations. Uh, so. And I'm sure the finance ministry consults the market participants to factor in their views, their recommendations, etc. Uh, but they are not uh, actively engaged in the final decision, uh, at least not to the best of my knowledge. Yes. You mentioned that uh, SDS share is increasing over time, but is it biased over some states or uh, is it unbiased? 
Yeah, absolutely. So there are some states whose uh, finances are uh, better managed uh, than other states. Uh, there are some states where tax collection are greater, they are growing faster uh, than other states. Uh, in fact, some states don't issue SDLs at all because they don't have local uh, state finance machinery that can actually manage this process. See, each state, just, just the way I was describing how the center the finance ministry and the Department of Economic Affairs figure out their spending needs and how they're going to meet the spending needs. Now you would need such exercises to happen at the level of each individual state. So some states are clearly far ahead here than otherwise. Uh, and, so, uh, and you know the FRBM also sets limits on the fiscal deficits at the level of individual states and how much can they borrow. And if for some reason they have to go beyond the borrowing limits where they need explicit permission from the center in order to do that. So there is a spectrum, but uh, implicitly because the credit risk of the state development loans is considered to be more or less the same as that of the sovereign, there isn't too much variation as of now in the yields of different state development loans. There is a spread, it can sometimes be as small as five bits, it can sometimes be as wide as 15 bits, but it's more linked to illiquidity of the instruments. Is the issue large? Was, it, was the entire issue just acquired by one entity that wanted a higher yield of 50 or 75 basis points over the uh, If I can just say one thing, uh, the Reserve Bank of India produces an excellent state finances uh, report. It comes out around July or August every year. Uh, it's really a uh, fantastic read if you want to get more into government financing <coughs> uh, at the level of individual states and how they manage their budgets and issues. Yes. Why is the risk of SDA and the government G6 are the same? Uh, essentially, there is an implicit uh, guarantee. You know, we are a fiscal union, so there is an implicit guarantee that the state's needs will eventually be met by the, by the central government to a situation where the state doesn't have any great, uh, finances to repay its borrowings. Uh, and states maintain with the Reserve Bank of India certain balances. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit like uh, if you want, uh, you know, like a deductible uh, where you maintain a cash account which will be segregated at the Reserve Bank. So that in case your uh, weekly or monthly cash flow activity becomes unpredictable and you are not able to meet your exact interest or principal payments on time, the Reserve Bank of India as the debt manager will be able to deduct your balances from that segregated account to meet. And there are also limits uh, on whether you can go beyond that amount. So the, in that case, the Reserve Bank of India will give you quote unquote an overdraft. You know, just the way you could uh, draw down from an overdraft facility on your own bank account. We've run out of your savings, but you're still withdrawing. But because you're in an overdraft facility, uh, you know, the bank will charge you for it the same way the Reserve Bank charges a certain fee for this overdraft facility. So the combination of the implicit guarantee from the sovereign and this automatic debit mechanism with the Reserve Bank of India means that on a credit risk perspective, these instruments are the same. Uh, whereas on liquidity, they might have variation. An analogy would be that you know in the United States, <coughs> uh, there is the federal government uh, bonds, uh, and then there is this debt of the government-sponsored enterprises in the housing finance called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Now, for all practical purposes, it's the same credit risk as the United States government, but Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's bonds, they generally will give you 40 to 50 basis points yield higher than the federal government treasuries, and that's because they are not as liquid as the treasury market. So, uh, okay. maybe uh, let's, let's proceed and then otherwise we'll I need a respiratory pause on the answers that I'm giving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please, please go ahead. So let's turn to growth and liquidity of the corporate bond market. By the way, we are moving in the three-hour direction. I should just warn you, so you want to go and get some at least for yourself. <laughs> okay. The corporate bond market has grown over the years in India to a size of now around 450 billion US dollars of outstanding stock as of March 2019. 
that's an annualized growth rate of 13.5% during the last uh, four or five years. Uh, now, unlike the issuance process that I described for government securities, in the corporate space, the placement of securities is done through private placement, which is uh, you arrange an investment bank that will do the underwriting of the bonds for you, and they will place these bonds to investors. Uh, and uh, the issuance is dominated by high credit issuers. In 2018-19, for example, 79% of the issuances were by corporate entities that were rated at that A or higher. Secondary market trading in corporate bonds has picked up in the recent past with trading volumes ranging on an annualized basis. Uh, in 14-15, it was $170 billion. Now it is, in the last year, 18-19, it was close to $270 billion. So it's moving in the right direction, but I think as you saw in the graph here, overall the daily turnover in the corporate bond volume is at the bottom of these three cash markets. It's the DSEC plus SDLs first, then the equity, and then the corporate bonds. Uh, another important thing, trading in the corporate bonds is entirely over the counter with trades that are settled bilaterally, and then the trades are reported to stock exchanges. Okay, so uh, the difference between the GSEC market and corporate bond market, if I could just make it clear, anonymous trading in the GSEC, but non-anonymous trading in corporates, uh, trading with guarantees by the CCIL in GSEC, but bilateral settlement in corporate bonds, uh, trades are reported near real time to CCIL, trades are reported near real time, but to exchanges in the corporate bond market. Okay, now what are some of the recent developments in the corporate bond market? Um, there has been a great pickup in uh, savings in domestic institutions such as mutual funds, pension funds, and insurance funds. And there has also been enhanced FPI interest in investing in the Indian corporate bonds. Uh, so that's one important recent development, that the investor base is actually getting to be deeper. Uh, second, there are funding markets that are now created for corporate bonds. So even though corporate bonds don't trade themselves as much in the secondary market, what if I can just lend my corporate bond to someone and borrow against it? So I'm not outright doing a sale, but I'm just temporarily lending my corporate bond to someone and I'll borrow against it. This is called as a repo transaction, where effectively you sell, but you agree to repurchase it at a later point of time. Uh, the repo markets in corporate bonds are now also tri-party repo. So instead of bilateral settlement, the National Stock Exchange will act as a counterparty and therefore guarantee you settlement in the transaction rather than there being risk of delivery failures. So this is, I think, an important development uh, that should lead to greater funding liquidity of corporate bonds in future. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, the implementation of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code or the IBC starting December 16th for resolution of non-financial corporate entities in a time-bound manner is expected because it's going to strengthen the protection of creditor rights, rights, it is expected to enhance creditor recoveries when a firm defaults. And then the expectation is that in turn, instead of only the high-rated companies going and issuing bonds, maybe even distressed companies or junk bonds might get issued in India in due course. I think this would be fantastic if it were to materialize. And why is this quite important? Let me show you this one graph from the CGFS report. India is not in this graph for some reason in the survey, we didn't get a number. But these are the total non-financial corporation debt securities as a proportion of GDP. Uh, the red points are the emerging markets, the blue points are the developed markets. And these are the recovery rates when these non-financial corporates default. So someone who has lent to you a bank or a bond investor, when they go through the bankruptcy process, Relative to the promised amount, what is their recovery? Of course, default means that recovery is not 100%. But the question is how low or high it is. And what you see here is that on average, emerging markets are on the left here, the developed markets are to the right. But there are emerging markets like Korea and Singapore, which are now 
running fairly efficient bankruptcy mechanisms, so the recovery rates are very high. Recoveries in India are around 25% at, at the present moment before the IBC came into play. Of course, we have to let the IBC play out for at least five years before we know what sort of recoveries it generates. But the expectation is that by strengthening creditor rights, we might move to the right. And then if this graph is sort of a regularity of uh, economics, then what should happen is that as the recovery rates improve, the size of the non-financial corporate bond markets might improve as well when this happens. Okay. Uh, now, one other, so that, that was about the size and the liquidity so far. Another important point is investor base. I've already touched upon this a little bit, uh, but the Reserve Bank in, in the markets it regulates has been working quite hard to expand the investor base and thereby the liquidity of the markets. Uh, the investor base for GSEX, for example, has uh, evolved quite a bit over the last decade. So this pie chart tells you uh, in 2007 March, relative to the total outstanding stock of government securities, who was holding what percentage share? And then how does that pie chart shift if we look at, say, December 2018? Okay, so this is not a chart about evolution of numbers. This is about taking the current stock at a given point of time and who holds what proportion of securities of the government. Now what you see here, what is most striking is that the commercial banks were owning almost 50% of the GSEX in March 2007, and that number has come down to around 40% at present. Where has that share gone? That share has gone to insurance companies a little bit, so there's a small 1.5% increase in insurance companies, and corporates are owning more. Foreign portfolio investors are now owning about 4% of the GSEC market, and they were virtually non-existent in the GSEC market in March 2007. Okay, so that's the sense in which uh, the investor base is gradually deepening, uh, even if at a somewhat uh, gradual pace over the past decade. And last, uh, funding and uh, derivatives markets. Uh, the CGFS report considered these complementary markets to also be quite crucial for transferring risk and funding illiquid assets. Uh, and these markets in India are very good, uh, especially in the GSEC space. Again, I'm always impressed with the state of our uh, government securities markets. The repo funding in the Indian GSEC markets is fairly deep. There's a daily trading volume of about $20 billion uh, in this market. So even the non-benchmark government securities, which don't trade liquidly, so you may not be able to sell it to someone, but you can still raise funding against it by doing a repo transaction. So it's not that you will not get any money because you can't sell it in the market easily to someone else. You, you may want to show the next stuff. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at the uh, chart over here, you can see that uh, this repo market from 9, 10 until now, uh, this is the GSEC market has been quite stable. It has been steadily improving since 11, 12. Uh, and again, this repo market works through this uh, CCIL, so guarantees, uh, delivery is guaranteed, settlement is guaranteed, and that helps a lot uh, with the development of the market. And importantly, you will see from a very low base, so the corporate bond repo is on the right axis, it's not on the left axis. It is showing a sharp pickup, but at a much lower level, and that's because now tri-party repo where National Stock Exchange or some other tri-party will guarantee settlement, etc., has now been provided even in the corporate bond space. So we expect this to keep growing uh, in the years to come. Okay, so that was an overall uh, description of the market. The question is, what has enabled the growth of Indian capital markets to reach this stage? And to answer this, I'll discuss the policy measures that have been taken in India easily the findings and the recommendations of the CGFS report. Uh, just to remind you, there were two sorts of broad uh, drivers, the enabling environment uh, and then the capital market specific drivers. And I'm going to do a little bit of a rundown on this for India in terms of the specific points. Of course, there's a bit of overlap here and there, so uh, if, you are, if you think it's meandering a bit, you can go back and see the exact classification. 
Uh, the most important one for me here personally is macroeconomic stability. In fact, it's so interesting. Uh, recently, we had the uh, 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 Gear Stein Carstens from Bank for International Settlements. Uh, he, he's basically the MD, the managing director or the chairman of the BIS. He gave a talk on financial inclusion at the Reserve Bank of India. Usually, when we think of financial inclusion, we think about uh, running programs in villages, uh, doing literacy programs, education programs to get them to know about banking services, mutual funds, etc., etc. But he showed some cross-country evidence that the most important determinant of high financial inclusion in, in a country is the stable macroeconomics. If you keep growing at a stable growth rate and the inflation rate in the economy is not very high and doesn't have huge spikes and collapses, then actually the financialization of savings, even at the bottom of the pyramid, actually tends to be high. And I think this is an underappreciated point that I, I want to spend a little bit of time on. Uh, everyone in India is always asking the question, why should the Reserve Bank of India target inflation and try to keep it stable? And while there are macroeconomic stability is in itself a desirable objective, it has several spillovers in the sense that financialization of savings will increase once you have a stable macroeconomic environment. Okay. So first, India's GDP growth. You can see that it has been uh, fairly steady over uh, the last uh, 15 years, uh, or even uh, longer than that. Uh, and uh, it's been among the highest uh, next over the first uh, 10 years over here to China and off late uh, bouncing around above and below China's growth rate. But I want to spend more time on the inflation. Uh, as you can see over here, uh, the inflation was actually at double digit levels. In fact, at a peak of 16.2% after the uh, global financial crisis. But even before the taper tantrum in the summer of 2013, it was actually at double digits levels, levels in excess of 10%. Now, uh, it has steadily come down since then, and you can see very sharply since the taper tantrum episode. And that's because the Reserve Bank adopted an inflation targeting approach, first informally from 2013 fall, so September 2013 till August 2016, and then formally through a legislative mandate, which requires that the Monetary Policy Committee of the RBI target a consumer price inflation uh, rate of 4% with a band of 2% above and below. Now, why is this decline, steady decline of inflation? In fact, over the last two years, the average inflation has been 3.5, 3.6%. So it's slightly below the mandated target of 4%. Why is this extremely important for further development of capital markets? High levels of inflation mean that your financial savings are getting eroded very quickly in terms of their real purchasing power. Okay, the, the value of money is deteriorating. That's what inflation does uh, uh, to, to savings. So in a high inflation economy, uh, you would see greater savings which are in the form of real assets, such as housing or commodities like gold. And indeed, if you look at the Household Finance Committee report uh, by uh, Professor Tarun Ramadurai from Imperial College that came out in 2017. You will see that on average, the level of household wealth or net worth, which is in real estate and gold in India, is, is at abnormally high levels compared to other countries. Why is that gradually reversing over the last four or five years? In my opinion, one of the important reasons is that inflation has actually become stable, where your financial savings are not getting eroded as quickly as they used to uh, until recently. There are other factors besides inflation targeting that have helped to rein in inflation expectations. Uh, this is, of course, the fact that uh, oil prices have come down since 2014, and there is more active food supply management by the government. Uh, because food prices used to uh, uh, run away very quickly because of supply shortages and adverse monsoon. Okay, so this way, in my opinion, if you look at growth and inflation combined, the two 
main preconditions of macroeconomic stability, stable growth and low inflation, which are necessary for financialization of savings and in turn capital market development, right? Because you won't keep all your savings in deposits because you want to earn a slightly higher yield on a part of your savings. So say, let me go to a mutual fund. Why just go to a mutual fund? Why don't I save for retirement? Why don't I insure against my car, my property, my life, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay, so that's first enabling the driver, the macroeconomic stability. In my opinion, we are a good place on this front. Uh, second is promoting market autonomy, okay, which is laying out the rules for markets to function and then not intervening in the market on an ad hoc basis unless it is really crucial for the regulators because of some systemic issues. So uh, there are several ways market autonomy has been promoted in India that has helped the development of viable capital markets. I'll go through a few of these. Uh, in active coordination with the government and other financial market regulators, in the markets that the Reserve Bank regulates, uh, it has undertaken a series of reforms uh, to rationalize the regulatory guidelines and procedures. Uh, so basically, new products in derivatives markets can now be innovated in a more liberal manner. So prior to such liberalization, any new derivative product had to be approved by the Reserve Bank of India. Now the Reserve Bank of India just says a class of products can be issued by the markets. You choose how to design it, what tenor, and what sort of risk profile you want to attach to the product. Uh, so we have moved away from a prescriptive approach more to a principle-based uh, regulatory approach. Uh, now, of course, in the early phase, because you were uh, fairly prescriptive, when the economic needs were very high, certain segments of the economy or certain large companies would come to the Reserve Bank and say, listen, you put this restriction, but if the restriction is not relaxed for this sector, it's going to have huge economic consequences. And then there used to be ad hoc approvals for certain kinds of transactions to take place. So now RBI doesn't engage in this sort of ad hoc approvals, so that way the interference in development of the markets is minimized. Uh, and in particular, it, it has tried to come up with broad, comprehensive guidelines for issues such as market abuse regulation, how to regulate benchmark rates. Many of you might be aware that there was a scandal in 2008-9 on the London Interbank offer rate. That was a benchmark rate on which a lot of products in the interest rate derivatives market and loans were indexed. And then banks essentially seem to have colluded to manipulate that benchmark rate to not uh, reach very high levels. So, you know, we now have sort of broad guidelines so that we have the guide, everyone knows what the rules of the game are. If you are designing a new benchmark, these are the standards you have to adhere to and that is what we will hold you subject to. Okay, so there's been a rationalization of this type. Uh, second, and I can't stress this enough, uh, development of financial market institutions and infrastructures. Uh, here, as I said, uh, the, the, the past uh, governors, deputy governors and market departments at RBI have done several excellent, uh, uh, have undertaken several excellent initiatives. Uh, one, I mentioned the anonymous trading platform, NDS Home. Uh, second, uh, if you recall at the time of Lehman Brothers' failure, it was hard to know how many bets there are in the derivatives market with Lehman Brothers as the underlying or who are Lehman Brothers counterparts, because these were all over-the-counter trades, and you didn't even know how to aggregate the transactions. So the world has moved on, and so has uh, India. So every transaction that happens, even in the over-the-counter space, is required to have for both counterparties its unique legal entity identifier code. So you just have to run a database query on the data registry of all transactions with the unique LEI code of say one bank or one insurance company and you will know exactly all of their positions in the capital markets in just a database search. It won't be as quick as that. Uh, as I said, retail investors are usually cleaned off by dealers in various kinds of markets. Most notably, if many of you do FX transactions, like I used to send money regularly to my parents when I was in New York. And 3% was always an FX fee that used to get charged on these transactions, regardless of what quantum you take. If you're a small guy, you have to pay 3%. Uh, 
Uh, this is true not just in India, it's true actually even in developed countries such as uh, Europe uh, and United States. So what we have done, and I think this is going to be quite unique actually, uh, uh, I think in the whole world, which is that the Reserve Bank, working along with the CCIL, uh, has, uh, CCIL has now basically developed an FX retail platform where retail investors will effectively directly participate in an anonymous FX trading platform with the dealer. So rather than you just going to the bank that you are dealing with where your account is, you can actually go to a market and see who is actually offering you the best rate in order to convert your FX into one market or the other. This is going to be operational from August 2019 to the extent that it brings down the FX trading costs our, uh, our expectation is that it will actually increase the trading volumes in the Indian FX market, which is already quite liquid right now. Around $30 billion gets traded in the FX spot. That might increase even further, improving uh, the exchange rate market uh, uh, stability and efficiency. Uh, and rather than allowing individual market players to determine benchmarks such as LIBOR, etc., in our case it would be LIBOR, the Mumbai Interbank Offer Rate. Uh, the Reserve Bank of India has helped set up an independent financial benchmark administrator called the FBIL, the Financial Benchmarks of India Limited. So this is like a utility that takes all the market prices, cleans them up, looks for uh, outliers, and then produces basically end of the day benchmarks to which products can actually be claimed. The value of an independent utility that's doing this is that it reduces the scope for market abuse because no one can manipulate the prices that easily because either RBI's market surveillance unit will pick it up or the FBI will recognize that something looks odd uh, on the potter end, for example, that something is not looking right in the prices. Okay. Uh, third, um, uh, in terms of uh, Deepening the investor base, uh, RBI has moved towards relaxation of market restrictions. Okay, so one of the most uh, repressive or coercive uh, restrictions that was in place in the Indian fixed income markets was that of the total deposits, so this is net deposit and time liabilities, just think of it as deposits of a bank, a minimum percentage had to be held in the form of central government or state development securities. Uh, in 1990, at its peak, this number was 38.5%. Okay, what does this mean? This means that if I go to a bank and deposit 100 rupees, automatically, whether the bank wants it or not, 38.5 rupees are going to fund the deficits of the central government and the state government. Uh, the, it was it is called at the called the statutory liquidity ratio, and economists would call it financial repression. Okay. That, uh, basically, you are repressing the savers for only going into the low-ending government securities. You are not allowing the deposits to actually potentially earn higher rates because if the banks could use this money to lend at higher rates to the private sector, they could also offer higher rates to the depositors. Uh, you can see here that steadily this ratio has now been brought down to about 20%. And you can see that unsurprisingly, therefore, if you recall those pie charts, the share of bank holdings has actually gone down from 50% to 40% in the government securities market. Now, of course, others have come in to fill this space. And therefore, this regulation in terms of relaxing the restriction has been extremely important. Uh, there are also restrictions on FPIs for investing in the government securities markets and the corporate bond markets. Uh, sometimes the FBI investors are called as bond tourists, uh, which is that they come to invest in the Indian bond markets. As long as the weather is nice, they stay in the country. And once there is a cyclone or a heavy monsoon, then they fly out. Uh, they take the... Uh, So usually you, pro you don't want to stop them from leaving once they've entered. <coughs> so that would mean no one comes back into your country ever again. What you want to do is to manage these hot money flows when they are coming in so that they don't become so large relative to the size of your markets 
that when they are leaving as bond tourists back to their homes, uh, you don't get an amplification of whatever monsoon or cyclone that's happening in your fixed income and exchange rate markets. So, um, uh, so what do you see here? The red line is actually this limit. So these limits are also getting relaxed in billion dollar terms. Even as a percentage of the GSEC market, they are getting relaxed. Right now, the GSEC limit is about 6% of the total issuance. Uh, and you can see that at least on a longer term basis, the participation has increased. Uh, the same way for corporate bonds. Uh, corporate bond limits have stayed relatively stable, but the limits have not been fully utilized. Uh, you can see that the GSEC limits at certain points have been close to full utilization. The FPIs have come in fully up to the limits that they have allowed. Last year, as you know, there was a wave of outflows in response to high interest rates, uh, high oil prices, etc. And you can see that dip over there. Uh, the corporate bonds, there is still sort of residual space. Now, these limits are one way of uh, dealing with the bond tourists. Another way is to tell them that you can come in for larger amounts if you want but you have to lock in your investments for a certain minimum period of time. So we have started one scheme called the Voluntary Retention Rule. And under this scheme, uh, FPIs who come in through this route, uh, they are given further relaxations in terms of where all they can invest, how much they can invest. But 75% of their investment at any point of time, they have to maintain in uh, at least 75% of the investment they cannot take out within three years. So they have to lock in their funds for at least three years when the, when the funds come in. Okay, and then uh, for the third, there is the strengthening the legal and the regulatory framework for investor protection. Uh, in case of government securities markets, we have an excellent legal framework. I won't go through the various acts uh, that protect the rights of investors in the GSEC markets and the SDL markets. Uh, uh, and the IBC, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, is expected to get uh, stronger in terms of protection of creditors when there are non-financial corporate entities that default. Uh, one lacuna in this space is that if non-bank financial entities uh, have a default, uh, as of now, we don't have a resolution mechanism. Okay, so they are explicitly excluded from the insolvency and bankruptcy court. Uh, there was the FRDI bill, which has been, which is temporarily put off. There, they were supposed to be handled in terms of how to resolve them. But right now, we have a gap, and it's an important gap that needs uh, that deserves prompt attention of the authorities. Uh, Okay, so I'll just uh, go through a few other quick things uh, and maybe leave some time for questions. Uh, what are some other areas where uh, there are some gaps? Uh, one important area is the disclosure regime. So uh, IBC and low recoveries uh, could be uh, sort of not having an IBC in place and therefore low recoveries might be one reason why distressed debt investments are not taking place. Uh, another reason could be that there isn't adequate information that is relevant to know when a firm is going to default. Now, of course, the regulatory authorities have been improving the disclosure standards for corporates, especially if they are listed on exchanges. However, as you know, a few instances of recent defaults in commercial paper and corporate bond markets uh, of companies that were in investment grade rating has raised questions about the quality of disclosure, which is whether market participants, rating agencies, regulators, are they getting high quality information about true economic state of a firm to know that whether the default probabilities are going up or down uh, in a gradual and timely manner. But I think this is something that we could assess. Uh, and, 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 and I think as I was saying, to know where you stand, Sometimes it's good to assess yourself relative to the best international practices. So I think one can look at the disclosure standards of a range of well-developed corporate bond market countries and see where we stand relative to, say, Korea or Japan, United States, UK, etc. Um, okay. Um, I think I will go in interest of time.
run directly to the recent uh, initiatives. So I have skipped some of the other reforms that we have undertaken <coughs> recently since the speech is already on the website and you all look so fascinated by this topic. <laughs> uh, I encourage you to go and uh, read up more about it. But, but I think there are four recent initiatives that I think are quite important and I'm, I'm super excited about them even if uh, I'm leaving soon. Uh, one, uh, we have set up a task force on offshore rupee markets. Uh, so what is an offshore rupee market? So the capital account convertibility at the present stage in India's development is at a point where we are not allowing the Indian rupee to trade outside of India. So it may happen in a grey market, but officially it is not allowed. You can't write contracts outside India and settle them in Indian rupees outside India. Now, of course, there may be people outside India who are exposed to fluctuations of the Indian exchange rate. They may find it cumbersome for whatever reason, either transactions cost, KYC compliance, etc., to want to come to India for trading in order to hedge their exposures to the exchange rate risk. So they could say, let's do a transaction abroad the financial contract will be linked to the Indian exchange rate, but we will settle it in dollars. We don't have to settle it in rupees. But because the contract is linked to the rupee exchange rate, it's as though the rupee is, the value of the rupee is trading abroad. So these are called as offshore rupee markets. The primary contract there is the non-deliverable forward. Non-deliverable because it's not the rupee that you will deliver, you will convert the rupee amount at the spot exchange rate into dollars or another currency and then settle it in that other currency. Now, uh, unless you get sort of very coercive on your banks and foreign banks, and you may not have jurisdictional powers to do that, you can't really prevent these markets from being out there. So the RBI has set up a task force under the chairmanship of uh, Mrs. Usha Thurat, who was a former deputy governor at RBI, actually a big contributor to the development of the GSEC markets. Uh, this uh, task force was set up in Feb 19 to examine in depth issues relating to the offshore rupee markets and recommend ways through which non-residents who are trading abroad on the value of the rupee, how do we bring them gradually to the domestic markets so that liquidity actually deepens our domestic market. So right now, as I said, uh, dollar rupee in the domestic market trades about 30 billion dollars on a day. Almost about the same amount trades outside India in these offshore rupee markets. So if we could bring those volumes to India, actually our market would almost double in its size. Uh, the report of the task force is due by mid-July, so if you are interested in these markets, I encourage you to look at that. Uh, second, we have an internal working group on market timing. So again, this is something I'm very excited about is that because there are these offshore rupee markets, you know, they are in Singapore, they are in London, etc. Uh, what it means is that there are people who are trading based on the value of the Indian rupee outside of the Indian market trading hours. So every day before the Indian market opens, you get a signal about the value of the Indian rupee from Singapore. Similarly, even after the Indian market has shut down, you continue to get signals about the value of the Indian rupee because the rupee is trading in the offshore London market. Now, one way you can try to attract some of these players to come in. So if the reason why they are trading abroad is because the Indian markets are simply closed, what you can do is actually stretch the timing period over which the Indian markets are open. So you know that would bring in some of the flows. Now, of course, this is complicated because your entire payment <coughs> and settlement system has to be open over those windows. So you can't just decide for one market that you will do this, markets are linked. You know, someone, an FBI who's investing in India bonds is also taking an exchange rate risk. So they will have simultaneous position in the bond market and the FX market. They might say, oh, it really helps me only if you keep both the markets open for a longer period of time. So those sorts of things are being analyzed and we will uh, put out our internal working report for public feedback once it is submitted uh, within the RBI. And the next two, which have been announced more recently, uh, the, we are looking at a task force on the development of secondary market for corporate loans. 
I showed you that in case of Korea, the recoveries have increased quite a lot. One way that this has happened in Korea is that when the Southeast Asian crisis happened in 97-98, uh, South Korea developed a very active online trading platform for sales of distressed loans. They standardized the securities and they created a lot of transparency in terms of underlying contracts, price discovery, etc. for players to bet on distressed loans. Uh, so we want to investigate how to make that happen in India and there's a task force that's going to submit its report by end of August. And finally, uh, uh, we don't have very deep and well-developed securitization markets for mortgages in India. Uh, in the United States, for example, once a bank or a mortgage lender provides a mortgage, typically the bank doesn't necessarily sit on the mortgage unless it is very large or uh, not conforming to securitization standards. So there are what are called as conforming mortgages, which is that if they meet certain requirements, typically a pool of such mortgages will actually get redistributed into capital markets. In fact, their interest rate risk may be sent separately, their principal risk may be sold separately to some investors. Someone might be providing a credit guarantee on the mortgage default in order to isolate the credit risk from the fixed income component of the security. Now, all of this requires definition of conforming standards, standardization of contracts, ease of knowing what pool of mortgages is actually being put up for securitization. So there's also a committee that's been set up so that rather than just buying an individual mortgage outright, which is a very information sensitive contract, if you are selling large pools of mortgages which are going to adhere to certain standards, it would be easier to create secondary market liquidity. So that's also out there. So let me end. Uh, I like poetry, so I try to end most of my speeches with some poetry. Uh, so in summary, it should be clear that while Indian capital markets have evolved steadily to a stage of long-run viability, the potential for developing and strengthening them further is limitless. So let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to live. I hope many of you will join the capital markets and financial institutions and will take the agenda forward.
Now when somebody else is coming and then want to buy, overnight he is coming and saying that I have the money, I will give you 50,000 crores. Now in that such a situation, why RBI and then other bankers are not coming out and then questioning him? Where were you all these years for decades? One, if you have the money, why you, you haven't paid? Okay, now you pay first. That's uh, the question. Uh, and there are multiple okay, so also which are hindering the IPC process. So what can be done for that? So you know, uh, it, it's it's a it's a court based system. So it's an insolvency and bankruptcy court that the courts have to administer. It's not individual or individual entities who have to administer this court. Uh, whenever there is a new law that is being implemented, case law develops and evolves based on the interpretation <coughs> of the law, the precedences, etc. that get set up. We are in the midst of that process. Uh, I don't think it would be right to comment on an individual case. It is also sub judice at present. Uh, but I think this is typical of a lot of new laws. And uh, I think, as I said, uh, it is the way the code is written, uh, it is aimed at time-bound and efficient resolution that, that should ideally strengthen the creditor rights. Uh, and I think uh, we have to wait and see how the law evolves. But at least right now, the expectation, both amongst market participants and regulators, is that this is going to be a step forward compared to the debt recovery mechanism we have had so far. OK, two more questions. The gentleman in the conclusion. Yes. <laughs> Outside of this theme, because it's not so much about capital markets uh, per se, it's more about payment and settlements, uh, etc. Uh, my sense is at some point the Reserve Bank of India will probably yeah, put out its own views on this, so I think I should not jump the gun and fall into the trap. <laughs> okay, one, one last question. Let me see. Uh, the, the, the gentleman in the back over there. So there are rate cuts like Sydney rate cut, Sydney cut. We and can't hear you. Mm -hmm. So there are rate cuts all over the world like Sydney cut and Tokyo cut. How do they impact the uh, capital markets? Do they impact the uh, the extent of the impact is minimum or maximum? Can I, uh, that's a very wide range. <laughs> <laughs> Has to be between them. <laughs> no, uh, no, sorry, I'm being um, uh, You know, uh, I think it's not just important that a rate cut happens in the global economy somewhere. I think it's also important why it's taking place, and whether it is al was already anticipated. Because if it's already anticipated, then you know the reaction would have already happened. Typically, though, what the research at the Bank for International Settlements and academic work in this area is showing is that there is such a thing as a global financial cycle or a global uh, factor, global financial factor uh, that would comprise of things such as the strength of the US dollar, uh, the level of volatility index in the United States, uh, the price of commodities uh, such as oil, uh, and, and, and you know a few other factors like how much uh, money is flowing into emerging market mutual funds and so on. Uh, and what is seen is that these factors do fluctuate uh, quite a bit. Uh, uh, by the way, I should have also added the US uh, Federal Reserve rates uh, to that list. Uh, that, these, that some sort of composition of these uh, indices uh, does convey uh, whether emerging market investors are currently charging high risk premium for bearing the extra emerging market macro as well as extreme rate risks, or are they willing to accept these risks at a low uh, risk premium? So when risk premia are low, by and large you would expect that more capital all else equal would actually fly to emerging markets, and when the risk premia are high, uh, you know, there, would, there might be withdrawals or at least retrenchment uh, or reduction in the pace of flows that you are experiencing. So uh, what I was trying to say therefore was that before the rate cut could happen uh, the way 
things are worded right now as an insurance given that there has been high uncertainty about global economic prospects. So because the rate cut is endogenous to the economic conditions, there are two conflicting effects as you can see here. On the one hand, a rate cut should actually make it more attractive to go into higher yielding emerging market assets. But of course, the rate cut has happened precisely because risk has increased. And it could actually make investors more risk averse towards the emerging market conditions. So I think the answers are not as uh, clear. Uh, and I think that is what makes markets, capital markets interesting. That you have to look at prices in capital markets in order to know whether the impact of a given rate cut is likely to be higher flows or actually outflows uh, from emerging markets. You can actually look at exchange rates. You can look at the foreign portfolio investor flows. Uh, you can look at prices of securities where the presence of foreign investors is high in order to back out signals of whether the risk appetite is increasing or whether it is waning along with the rate cuts that you were I can see that's, that that's a good project for, uh, for, for an MBA or a master. Mm -hmm. I can see that there are a lot of questions. In fact, I have a thousand questions. Yeah. But uh, the way we want, I want to say this in poetry, which is, <laughs> Okay, so we'll invite you back, and hopefully when you come back, uh, you will be an academic, yes. and the question answer session will be a little bit more interesting. Uh, so we would like to leave you with uh, a small memento. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. And I cannot leave him without asking him to make a prediction. Since he's a great fan of India, is India going to win the World Cup or not? <laughs> Thank you all for coming.